All right, here we are. This is uh, Jonathan with the Hope Movement. This is a uh, Theology Famine Relief, um, Session 15. Um, we're doing the perfections or the attributes of God. And um, so we've been doing a whole mess load of, <laughs> uh, of uh, topics um, over the last 15 weeks. Um, we've been talking about um, the, the sufficiency of Scripture. We've been talking about um, the wrath of God, the patience of God, the, ju the justice of God, the, uh, the love of God, all these things that are functioning at the, at the same time. So he is a God of love, but yet he's a God of wrath and of justice. And so um, because he's of love, he's also patient and to, to bring on that wrath. But because he is a God of justice, he is also a God that has to bring wrath upon those that are, um, that, that are, that that deserve that the wrath of God. Um, he's a he's a God that is all powerful. We learned that last week. Uh, I'm uh, omnipotent. Um, we learned uh, about the grace of God, um, and there was so much more that we've learned um, in the last several weeks. Um, and we started out with the depravity of man and the doctrine of man, um, and we also touched on some issues about the biblical perspective of racism, um, which actually led us back to the depravity of man so um check out those videos they're right here on the facebook.com backslash hope movement you can also go to hope .com under our work um, we have um hope movement publications where we have theology famine relief in english and spanish um and uh you can also go to youtube as well so we're all over the place so check it out this is not for trying to say that we know more than anyone else um, uh, just a simple guy that has studied the Word of God and has been blown away by what I've learned and want to share it with everyone else um, because eternity is at risk. And, um, and so don't know everything, still learning it, and, and so we can learn together. And this is all for the glory of God and for the good of mankind that we can learn more about God, learn about who we are as humans, as, as depraved people, that don't deserve the grace of God, and yet he provides it for us, and that we are able, by the grace of God, by faith alone, be able to receive this precious gift of salvation, which will provide us eternal uh, glorification in heaven with our Savior for all time, and to, uh, to be able to not have to spend the rest of eternity in condemnation, but now justified, adopted into the family of God, and made into, um, into, and glorified with him for eternity. So this is what the gospel is. And so today we're going to be talking about the immensity and omnipresence of God. And so I'm just going to give you a quick um, 
uh, definition. This is not going to be a, a really long video, so st just stay stay connected. Uh, and if you have any desire to learn about God, um, then I would I would expect you to stay connected. You should have a very high view of God, a very low view of man. That God is not here to to meet all of our needs. It's not all about us. The Word of God is not all about us. It's all about Him. It's the Word of God, and it's about God. And so we need to um, have that understanding. He's sovereign over all things. He controls all things, and He wills all things. And even our own free will, He bends to His will. And so these are things that we need to have a clear understanding of as we are studying the Word of God and read it in its context, not have my own interpretations, but have the interpretation that is correct in its context in the Word of God. And if your church, denomination, I don't care what it is, um, is teaching otherwise, run from it and find a place that is teaching biblically. And so this is your eternity that's at, at, at hand. So by omnipresence, we're talking about that God is everywhere, present in the fullness of being, this allows him to interact in any places at any at, at any times, um, even multiple places uh, simultaneously, being in all locations present in the whole of his being. There is no place we can go to not be in his presence. This is a comfort to Christians, and it should be a torment to non-believers. And just to throw in there real quick, we're, we're going to get down down the road. We're going to get into talking about demons and, and the and the devil but the devil is not omnipresent so as we get into talking about the omnipresence of god it's important to understand that the devil is not omnipresent we were just talking about this in the theology class last night where if you look at the war room video there's a there's a, a section in the video that is is very powerful it's very moving and i i have to admit that i got caught up in it in in the moment um when i saw it i don't know a year or two ago, I can't remember now, but there's a part where she she gets out into the patio and she's trying to and she starts talking to the devil and she says to you to the devil, um, you know, Satan, I don't know where you are, but I know you're listening, and you can't have my family and you can't have da 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 da, and she goes on for this you know ten minute rant against the the devil. Um, the reality is that Satan is not omnipresent. He is not God. This is not a competition between two great powers and who can possibly win. Uh, this is about an awesome, sovereign God that is in control of all things and that Satan even has to ask permission in order to, to do what he is doing upon this earth. If you look at Job, you can have a clear um, view of that. And so that's important to understand. So looking back at that video of uh, War Room, where she's saying, Satan, I don't know where you are, but I know you're listening. Really? are You You don't really know if he's listening because he's not omnipresent. And so that's something clear to understand as we get into talking about the omnipresence of God. And so we're going to go through some verses. Um, first, I'm just going to go through some some uh, some little definitions of omnipresence of God, and then I'm going to use some uh, talk about some different um, some uh, articles that that I think is is important to read um, from R.C. Sproul. I think that you enjoy as well. So first, God is perfectly present with Himself, transcending all limita limitation of space, and yet present with every point of space with all that He is. Transcendence means that God is greater than and independent of creation. Immensity refers to the fact that God transcends and fills all space. And omnipresence indicates that God is present with every point of space in his entire being. And so we're going to look at some biblical e evidence of God's immens immensity and omnipresence. Um, and, is, and it's visible in, in many observations. So just looking at um, number one, he is the creator and possessor of all things. And we see this in Genesis 14, 19, Genesis 14, 22, Deuteronomy 10, 14. And again, take notes as I'm mentioning these verses, because I want you to not just be listening. This, uh, this is not going to be a, a full seminary class. I want you to take notes. I want you to study it. And through discernment by the Holy Spirit, I want you to be able to, to come to these 
these truths. So Deuteronomy 10.14, Colossians 1.16, and Revelation 10.6. Number two, heaven and earth cannot contain him. And so we see this in 1 Kings 8.27, as well as 2 Chronicles uh, 2.6, Isaiah 66.1, and Acts 7.48 through 49. He fills heaven and earth so nothing is hidden from his presence. And he is both close and far off. And we see this in Psalms 139, 7 through 10, Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24, Acts 17, um, 27 through 28. And so number four, he manifests himself in various, and variously in various places. So we're going to look at several points with this one. So he dwells and has his throne in heaven. We find this in Deuteronomy 26, 15, 2 Samuel 22, 7, 1 Kings 8, 32, Psalms 11, 4, Psalms 33, uh, 13, Psalms 115, 3, as well as Psalms 115, 16, Isaiah 63, 15, Matthew 5, 34, Matthew 6, 9, um, John 14, 2, Ephesians 1, 20, uh, Hebrews 1, 3, Revelation 1, 4 through 5. I think there's plenty of evidence right there. He transcend, he descends excuse me, from heaven, and we find this in Genesis 3, 8, Genesis 11, 5, Le, uh, Genesis 11, uh, 7, Genesis 12, 7, Genesis 15, 1, Genesis 18, 1, Exodus 3, 7 through 8, Exodus 19, 9. Exodus 19.11, as well as 18 and 20, Deuteronomy 33.2, and Judges 5.4. He dwells in the midst of his people, Exodus 20.24, 20, Exodus 25.8, Exodus 40.34-35, Deuteronomy 12-11, 1 Samuel 4.4, 4, um, 2 Samuel 6.2, 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11, and 2 Kings 19, 15. And he is far, rationally, from the wicked. Psalms 11, 5. So this is something clear to understand. People often think God loves the sinner and he hates the sin. That's a very common um, phrase to say. The Bible actually says that he... Uh, hates the wicked and he hates wickedness and they're actually enemies of God and yet his great grace that he has that's part of his attributes that we're learning that are functioning at the same time although he's angry he's also a God of love he's a God of grace and for those that he has elected that he has great grace upon he, he allows common grace the rain to fall upon the wicked as well as upon those that the righteous but then also we look at that he is patient with those that are wicked uh, until as they come to salvation through the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So we see this in, in um, Psalms, uh, um, excuse me, 11, uh, 11, 5, um, uh, Psalms 11, uh, Psalms 50, 16 through 21, Psalms 145, 20. And then he's also close rationally to the righteous. So those that have been regenerated, repented, justified, adopted into the family of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, um, the righteous, Psalms 11, 7, Psalms 11, uh, 51, 19, Isaiah 57, 15. And then Christ is, also, is, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that's Colossians 2, 9. And God indwells the church, John 14, 23. Romans 8, 9, um, as well as Romans 8, 11, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and Ephesians 22, 22, and Ephesians 3, 17. So take the time to check those verses out. Um, you can always go back on this video and, and copy those down if you weren't able to write them down quickly. I'm trying, I don't want to, I want to make sure you can have time to check it, to write it down, but at the same time, be conscientious of time. So some specifics of immensity and omnipresence. God transcends space. He is inherently immense and omnipresent regardless of the 
existence of time and matter. That is, he is always present with himself. He is also immense and omnipresent with, with relation to the creation. Space is an aspect of creation, so it is not part of God. This, these perfections mean that God is not dis, di, diffused through space, um, um, so that only part of him is in each place. Also, God is not bound to one place. God is fully present in every place, but he is also sustaining space by the immensity, by his immensity. His immensity does not mean he is separate from creation in a uh, dia, uh, uh, dia, dia, let's see, um, that he's, that he's a, a God that's so uh, far off that he's separate from all these things, although it does mean that he is distinct from and greater than creation. God upholds the created order by being entirely present with every point of space. This is true, for example, in both heaven and hell, which we find in Revelations, an example, uh, 14, 9 through 10, and in the righteous and the wicked. Actually, it is better to say that God is with time and space rather than being in time and space. Um, both, uh, and there was a, a, this is against the 19th century liberalism concept of God as only uh, imminent, um, but both are correct, provided that one does not see God as of or bound by time. So that's something very important to understand. So let's talk a little bit about seeing what some verses say about the omnipresence of God. So we, we mentioned some of these in the verses that I mentioned that I hope you copy down and will study on your own time. Um, but let's look at 1 Kings 8.27. Um, but God, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. Job eleven seven through 9. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. Uh, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I cannot see him, says the Lord? Do I, do I not fill the heaven and earth, says the Lord? Psalms 139, 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your spirit? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I make, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in uh, in the other utter most parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Psalms ninety one through two, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Behold, the mountains where were brought forth and or ever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalms 46.1 God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in, in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Job 34.21 for your eyes are on the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. Amos three uh, nine two through four. If they dig into Sheol, from there shall my hand take them, and if they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down, and if they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search them out and take them. And if they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. And if they go into captivity before their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes upon the, them for the evil and not for good. 
Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so that was going back, thinking about that war room um, analogy that we, we talked about in the beginning. If you notice, she was talking about, she was talking to Satan. And I love this, that we, we learned this last night at um, a theology class with Pastor Craig. Shout out to Craig. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't see in the Bible where we are to talk to Satan. Um, you don't see that in the, in the first century church. Um, you see, and in, in, in that movie, it was talking about, you know, go into your closet and that kind of thing. If you look at that, what does it say? Go into your closet. Go into, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. In other words, that when Satan is attacking you, he go to him. He's the all-powerful, sovereign God who's over all things that is even allowing Satan to do, cause these temptations and these attacks against you. Go to him. He's all-powerful, and he's in control, and he's the one that will move Satan away from you uh, it, when he wills it. And so it's important to understand that. Acts seventeen twenty four, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So we often talk about buildings, church buildings, and we say, you know, we are in the house of God. I remember being a kid growing up in church, and we, um, we were building um, kind of a children's room um, and at the, in the basement. There was um, a bunch of classrooms down there. So we're building kind of like a puppet stage down there for that would would um, teach Bible stories and things like that with, with puppets. Um, and I remember um, we would work late at night. It was like three of us, three, three friends of mine, and we were doing this. And I remember, I don't know what time it was, um, and I was a teenager. And um, I remember walking outside to throw out some wood or something like that, and I got spooked by something, you know, just like kids. A, you know, a kid getting spooked by being all by himself away from his parents and he's, you know, and he's hanging out there. And, and then, you know, I, I go back downstairs and, you know, and it's kind of, it's a dark hallway and all that kind of stuff. And you think about that, that we always talk about, you know, this building is the house of God where it should just radiate in our minds. We think of this, that we, it radiates the presence of God. Whereas I was spooked. Why? Because as we see in this verse that that does not live in temples made by man. It's a building that was dark and a kid was spooked by the shadows on the wall and things like that. And yet we don't realize that we are the church. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit, not a building. These are some profound truths that we need to start understanding and start preaching correctly as we have not been for so long. So let's look at Revelations 21 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And so this is something very important as we get into this next part. So, looking at, we, we read Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24, and we're about to close here. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord, um, as being who is beyond measure? God cannot be contained in the finite, any finite space. Psalms 147.5. The fact that our Lord uh, has no um, spatial limitations has certain consequences uh, for how we understand his other attributes. With omnipresence being a logical counterpart of his in, in, infinity, um, uh, if God cannot be confined 
in the finite space, it, t it makes sense that he would be omnipresent. That is, present everywhere in creation. And, to, and so we look at that passage and, in Scripture, and that reveals to us our Creator's omnipresence. There is no place that we can hide in all creation because God fills all creation. No matter where we go, there our God will be. And he is not limited not to only one place. He cannot erect a barrier between ourselves and his presence. He transcends spatial limitations, and he is able to be in any, many places, indeed, everywhere, at, all at once. And so this is something spectacular. Omnipresence altogether is different. It means that, that the fullness of God is present everywhere. Everything that, that God is is fully present in, at each point in a given room, at every point in the building outside of the room, and every point outside of the building, more of God is not found at point A than in point B. God is his act and his attributes, including his holiness, wisdom, goodness, justice, knowledge, power, and so on, are fully present in his creation at every point. He often for we often forget that the Lord is right at hand wherever we are we are but our forgetfulness does not indicate his absence of course god reserves the right to make us feel his present presence more strongly at certain times and in particular places than in others and we can see that in exodus 3 1 um, as well as exodus 4 17 but even if god feels more present here than he does over there he is equally present in both places Thus, he gives us, guides us, every, uh, wherever we go. And we find that in Psalms 23. So God's omnipresence is a comforting truth. If God is everywhere, then we know he is never far away and can, and can come quickly to our aid. Because he is present everywhere, we can know that he is acting in each and every place according to his holy will for our good and achieve his purposes. This is, the tr this is true even when he seems to be far away. And so this is, again, seeing his sovereignty, trusting his sovereignty, and knowing that he's in all places. And also when we are sinning, to, to take that into account, that, that he is there in all places. And that should really, uh, when we know mom and dad are close by, we're less likely to act as if uh, in, 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 bad, in bad behavior. When we are very conscious and have a high view of God and very conscious of his presence, um, that he's omnipresent, whether you feel him or not, it's important to understand that he is, uh, that that also will help us as we try to kill sin in our lives. So I'm just going to read something real quick. Should I feel God's presence in my life? And so I thought this was a very uh, important article to read from R.C. Sproul, and we'll close with this. This question brings to mind an experience I had early in ministry. In fact, I had only been ordained a few months and was teaching at a college. One church had a minister who was much loved by his congregation. He had served there for 25 years, but had become critically ill. The man was at, at point of death, and I was supplying the pulpit um, with for several months um, and helping the congregation deal with this tragedy. So on a Saturday night before the Sunday ser morning service, um, in which we were to celebrate communion, I created and I received an urgent call um, that it was possible to minister. Um, would that that it was possible the minister would not live to the next day. And when I came to the church the next morning, I was keenly aware of the profound sense of concern that that was in the congregation. And I felt an enormous weight um, to, the, to try to have the most meaningful communion service I could possibly lead. I agonized in prayer, asking, saying, God, please let me have a special anointing as I come before these people in their need. I don't think I ever mounted the pulpit in my entire ministry with a greater desire to know the presence of God than I did that Sunday morning. I preached and I, I went through the sacrament and it was awful. It was terrible. I, I just felt total absence of God as if uh, I'd 
been utterly and completely abandoned by him. My preaching was dead. It seemed as if I was, were talking to myself when I pronounced the benediction and went back to the, uh, to the back of the church. I really wished there was a hole in the ground I could just jump into so that I couldn't have to face the people and felt so miserable for having let them down. I stood at the back of the door, and they started, started to file out the, of the church one by one, and I couldn't believe what happened. These people came out, and it was like they had been uh, hit between the eyes. They were stunned. They were in shock. One after another said they had never been so moved by a powerful presence of God as that which they had experienced in that worship service. One lady said to me, the Holy Spirit's presence was so thick today, we could have cut it with a knife. Uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. I felt like Jacob when he woke up from his dream and he said, surely God was in this place, and I knew it not. That really had an impact on me that day. I said, wait a minute, God promised that he would be there, would be here, and I didn't feel his presence. And so I thought he wasn't there. And I had become a sensuous uh, Christian, allowing my strength of conviction to be determined by the strength of my feelings. I realized that I have got to live by the word of God, not by what I feel. I think that's, I think that's how you deal with doubt. You begin to focus on what God says he's going to do rather than what you're feeling. And so I close with that, as to you understand that even when you don't feel God, He is omnipresent. He is constantly there. He is constantly sovereignly working. He's got everything planned out before the hands of time. Even those who will be saved, your, your faith is a gift. Your life is a gift. All creation is is a gift and strategically planned and positioned in the right place. One cannot function without the other. Salvation cannot function without the sovereign hand of God and, and to produce the faith in order to lead you to repentance, in order to lead you to justification. He is working all things, and he knows where you are, what you're doing, and what your needs are before you can ever ask or think of it. And if it is his will, he will accomplish what you, uh, what you ask. And when he doesn't, it means that he is working all things for his glory and for your good. And so even in the suffering, even in the sense of abandonment, trust and know that our sovereign God is always there, present with you, guiding you and directing you, whether you hear him, whether you feel him, or not. And so it's time for our churches to stop focusing on trying to create a false presence of God and preach the word of God and what it is so that they can have this confidence. That is why so many churches that are just creating a presence of God through music and through emotionalism, and yet they don't base it on the Word of God. They don't teach the Word of God. They don't teach it verse by verse. They don't teach verses in its context. They, people, most of their congregants don't understand how salvation works. You ask them, how, why did Jesus die? It would just be simply he died for our sins, but not that he took the wrath that we deserved and explain what justification is, what adoption is, what a re- regeneration is, all these things. They are ignorant to the, to the truths. And so when they understand the attributes of God, the plan of salvation, what exactly took place on the cross, what is to come, they will find rest in understanding that this sovereign plan of God is perfect. And even in those moments when we don't understand it, when it's a mystery, when we don't feel anything, when we don't, we feel abandoned and let go, let go from the hand of God and, and we are suffering. We look to the cross and we say, I know who I am in Christ and I trust in him and we preach Christ crucified and that is what we put our faith in, what we put our 
our solid uh, confidence in. And so in the midst of the storm, in the midst of trials, in the midst of sorrows, in the midst of the suffering, the abandonment, the, the, the silence, we know he's there and he's working all things for his glory and for our good. And ultimately, for all who believe in Christ, we have an assurance of knowing that one day in this life, not in this life, but beyond this life, all things will pass away and all things will become new. And we will be glorified and without pain, without suffering and forever in the presence, even feeling his presence at all times for eternity. And so this is the omnipresence of God. I hope that you were uh, moved by this. I hope you understand this clearly. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at info at hopemovement.com or comment these videos and share these videos with other people. Um, if you need prayer, if you have a question about salvation, um, contact us. We're here to, to serve and to uh, help you and guide you through uh, these questions that you may have in regards to salvation. So we love you very much. May God be glorified. And we uh, look forward to seeing you soon um, as we go and come back next week um, to continue to preach the gospel through theology, famine relief. May you have a, God, uh, a, a blessed evening and a great weekend. And we'll see you next week. Grace, grace and peace.